Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here for a second time with Dr. Michael Tomasello. He is Emeritus Director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, and James F. Bonk, Distinguished Professor at Duke University. And today we're going to focus on his new book, The Evolution of Agency, Behavioral Organization from Lizards to Humans. So, Dr. Tomasello, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on again. Thank you, Ricardo. So, let's start perhaps with a definition. What is agency from the perspective of evolutionary biology? What I'm claiming is that um, much of behavior can be thought of as kind of hardwired or stimulus response uh, in a lot of particularly, you know, um, ancient type animals. Uh, but uh, that kind of organization can't deal with unpredictabilities, with things that uh, evolution can't predict are coming. So what evolution has done is built um, uh, an architecture, a psychological architecture for the individual making decisions. So to deal with things that evolution can't predict, it's unpredictable from the point of view of natural selection. So uh, the example I give on the very first page is, okay, squirrels are in some sense hardwired to cache nuts, to hide nuts, right? But at this moment, this squirrel is looking at a particular landscape Natural selection doesn't know anything about this particular landscape. So in this particular moment, in this particular landscape, the squirrel has to decide where to place the nut. So that is where psychology begins. And the psychology of agency, meaning the individual, has to make the decision. So natural selection builds the machinery that enables this decision making, but then the decision making is the individual. So the kind of philosophical point of the book um, is that this is the dividing line between the biology of behavior and the psychology of behavior. The psychology is where it is the individual, and we can't get rid of the individual. The individual is there making the moment-by-moment -moment decision and adjusting to novel circumstances um, uh, in, in effective and adaptive ways. Mm -hmm. But if it's the individual making the decision, does that imply that uh, the particular behavior that is the result of that of that decision is under the control of the organism. Yes, um, and and I, that's, I use a control system model, like a thermostat or a self-driving car or something. That there's an architecture for this, and we know about it because we can build machines that do it. Machines are non-living things; they're made out of metal. Uh, there's nothing mysterious about it. There's no homunculus uh, people. Some people worry that my saying the individual makes the decision is like it's a homunculus or something. There's no homunculus in a self-driving car or in a uh, or in a thermostat. This is a way of organizing, and that's why I call the book behavioral organization. All right, and so um, uh, the 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 individual has a goal, and that goal might be set by evolution. So evolution wants us to eat. And so they produce hunger. And so, and so now I've, I've, I have a goal of getting food. Um, but then which food I choose, whether I, this food is nearby a dominant individual, so I better not go for that food. Here's some available food, but it's not very nutritious or tasty. I make the decision myself. And, and, and again, the philosophical argument is that a full analysis of behavior, you, you cannot leave out the individual, and the individual directs its behavior toward goals and controls its behavior through all kinds of self-regulating mechanisms. By, uh, um, for example, in my last example, uh, I'm choosing between this way of this behavior and that behavior, uh, then it's under my control which one I choose. But is this control necessarily conscious? No. Um, and I've never, if you will, I, this is my 10th book, and I don't think I've hardly ever talked about consciousness. I mention it in this book just a little bit, um, but because I think the um, people mean different things by it. And um, so I, I find the, the, the discussions usually not very productive because different people, different people mean different things. But if you just mean 
sentience of the outside world. I'm not, I wouldn't call that consciousness. So like qualia and all the kind of stuff that philosophers worry about, I, I wouldn't call that consciousness myself. I would call that sentience or perception, attention, sentience. Uh, and to me, what we really normally mean by conscious is something more reflective that I know what I'm doing. Not only am I doing it, but I know what I'm doing. And that takes um, some kind of executive, I call it an executive tier of organization, or indeed in the book, I have two of those tiers. And the second one is called reflective or metacognitive. So I can wonder about this or that before I actually do it. So I would say that is what you're talking about when you're talking about conscious is that not only am I behaving in the world, but I, I know what I'm doing. And metacognitively, I even know what I'm thinking about what I'm doing right, at some level. So th that's what we mean by conscious. I, I, maybe some people would call it self-conscious or something. I don't know. But um, so I think it's it has to do with executive levels of organization. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so a lizard, a lizard would have control, uh, but it wouldn't be conscious of that. So could you tell us about the feedback control model of agency that you explore in the book? Yes. So I think it's important. You know, psychologists um, love machine models. If you go all the way back to the behaviorists, they had a telephone switchboard um, as a model. And the model in cognitive science has been the digital computer. But the digital computer doesn't do anything, right? It sits there, it stores information, it retrieves information, it follows commands you give it, but it's not doing anything. And in evolution, um, uh, the key is adaptive actions, it is getting food, escaping predators, mating, it's doing things. And natural selection selects for effective adaptive actions and, and that meet certain goals. So control system organization is using a different machine metaphor. The machine metaphor here is um, control systems like thermostats and self-driving cars uh, where there is a goal to do something and the cognition is in the service of uh, those actions and those adaptive actions. And control system models have been known since the 1960s or so, the cybernetics people like Ross Ashby and uh, people like that. Um, and, and Miller, Galanter, and Prebrum on plans and the structure of behavior in the 60s has that kind of a model. Um, and it's just a model that if you're an evolutionist and you are interested in adaptive actions, uh, it's the model you have to have. And, a, and, a, and a, a, a digital computer that's just doing the information unconnected to behavioral decision making um, is, is not going to be uh, um, the right model for um, looking at behavior in an evolutionary context. And so this is the organization. The control system model is the organization. It's not about particular adaptation. So the squirrel is adapted for caching nuts and lizards are adapted for capturing insects and chimpanzees are adapted for using tools. Those are particular adaptations. Uh, this is the organization of decision making that I might want to use a tool, but this one's too short and that one's too long, or I might want that food, but there's a dominant nearby. So this is this um, control system where the individual pursues goals and controls their pursuit of them uh, and controls the decision making. Uh, that is the model, I think, uh, the only model that can really be used um, if you're looking at the evolution of um, uh, behavior and cognition. Mm -hmm. uh, in the book, you go through several different stages in the evolution of agency, and you start with animate actors that which uh, which are not really organized agentively, as you say, and you give the example of C. elegant. So, what characterizes these actors? Well. <laughs> That's very difficult. I have to say that um, I I worried. I, I I went back and forth about whether to call C. Elegans an agent or not. <laughs> okay. They do some things. They show a tad little tiny bit of flexibility, um, and and they're all kind of creatures in between. If if C. Elegans is somehow a model for the Cambrian explosion way back, you know, all those hundreds of millions of years ago, they're all kinds of creatures in between. And I just decided that I, I should stick with what I what I feel confident about. 
And, um, uh, you know, the first vertebrates are fish, but we don't know much about fish cognition. But lizards, we have actually a lot of good experiments with lizards. So it was partly a matter of convenience I started with. This. And I mentioned in the book that there are a number of people who think that all living things are agents. And that's just a slightly different meaning of agency. What they mean is they're active participants in their evolution by behaving in certain ways uh, and the way they behave influences how they're, you know, whether they're successful or not um, in evolution. Um, and so I actually say at that point that I'm talking about what I want to call psychological agents. And by that, I mean exactly the control system model, that they have goals and they pursue them. Uh, the C. elegans doesn't have a nervous system. It's kind of hard to think about what a goal would be if you don't even have a nervous system, because I assume that a goal is some kind of representation of something that you are motivated to bring about. So the way the control system works is, you know, I have a state of the world that I desire to be the case, that I want to be the case, and I behave until it is the case. So I perceive it to be the case. And I just don't see the C. elegans being organized in that way. Uh, but once you get, you know, organisms with a nervous system, and in particular, if they have a brain or at least ganglia, uh, then you have this sort of integration of perception and action. Uh, but I don't know if someone were to show some behavioral experiments that showed that uh, C. elegans um, is a goal-directed agent, then I would, I could live with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you also talk about what you call intentional agents like squirrels and rats. What differentiates them from the previous ones, the goal-directed agents like lizards and other reptiles? Okay, so the, the essence of my model is that uh, there, a key is when you have a, lego, a level of executive control. So um, squirrels, I think, I think the uh, lizards are just their goal directed agents that they just make yes no decisions yes should i go for this yes or no should i go for that yes or no they have a kind of a global inhibition where they if there's a predator they can stop everything but then when they come back it's yes or no do i do this yes or no do i do that squirrels start to look at one thing and say should i do this should i do that and uh, these are mammals in general i would say um, and um, uh, they are um, imagining what would happen if I did this, what would happen if I did that. I saw while I was writing the book, there's a squirrel in my, uh, I'm looking out over my front yard here and there's a squirrel on the branch kind of trying to decide whether he should leap to this other branch or not. And ultimately he goes down and crawls down and then crawls up another tree. So he's considering, he's imagining what would happen if he leaped or didn't leap. And, and, and there's that, that's not just, just not my impression. There's studies showing this. Um, and I think that is means that you need a layer of executive, uh, a tier, an executive tier of functioning where you can imagine actions without actually performing them. Um, and so I think this is what they're doing. And uh, uh, so this and so I conceptualize this executive tier of organization as itself a control system that um, whose goal it is to facilitate behavioral decision making. And so I say, would I, is it better if I do this or better if I do that? Blah, blah, blah. And that's aimed at, because I have a behavioral uh, problem in front of me and I'm trying to solve it on the executive level and then send it down to the action level and, and get it done. So, so this is, these are two tiers of, of behavioral decision-making. The goal-directed one is to make things happen in the world that meet your goals and the executive level um, the executive tier of, 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 of um, control um, is aimed at facilitating the decision making on the behavioral level. Mm -hmm. And so this executive tier arises in evolution with... Uh, I'm very, I try to be very clear in the book because whenever I talk about what animals can and can't do, I get people talking to me about birds and even insects and things. So I'm only talking about the animals on the track to humans. Uh, and so early vertebrates, early mammals, primates, humans, and that, that is a history, it's not a scala natura, it's a historical sequence. Humans are vertebrates, they are mammals, they are primates, and so they went through the sequence. So I don't know if it arose in other places, maybe, uh, maybe birds, uh, you know, I don't know. But um, uh, uh, I would say on the line to humans, it starts with mammals in general, yes. Mm -hmm. 
And where do, where do the goals that a particular organism has or develops come from? Are they hardwired, learned? Uh, the, the, the basic ones are hardwired. So the basic ones are built in. And I have a, a colleague of mine from years ago who wrote a paper called The Evolution of Desire. And, and the idea was that um, uh, uh, it's the, the same basic idea as this in the sense of um, when evolution wants you to do something, evolution can hardwire it in or evolution can give you the goal of ha making that happen and then letting you figure out how to make it happen given the particulars of the particular circumstance. So I would say that the basic goals of, th of let's just take the big three, of eating and of uh, escaping predators and mating. And I'm talking about the main goals of, you know, um, uh, vertebrates in general, say. Mm -hmm. Those are the big three. Now, I don't think, um, I don't think that humans have a goal of survival. Evolution wants you to survive, but uh, evolution wants you to eat, and evolution wants you to have sex, and evolution wants you to escape predators and, and escape dangers in general, I should say. Um, and uh, so those are built in. I don't think there. I don't. I don't see how there's. Any, I don't see how anybody could question that. That's. That, those are built in. Now, the rest of them, uh, it's absolutely true that an or uh, let's say down on the on the lowest level. An organism, uh, let's just say a squirrel, maybe a lizard too, but let's just stop. Let's just stick with the squirrel. Squirrels explore things, and they they are curious about things. And uh, if anybody wants to see how flexible squirrels are, go on YouTube and and uh, and and look for squirrels and and bird and bird feeders, and see how clever squirrels are at defeating humans when they try to get them to stay out of their bird feeders. Uh, so they may have a goal at this moment of opening the door of this bird feeder. That is not built in. That is, they have understood that this bird feeder has food inside of it um, and that this door will give them access to the food. So down on the lowest level of behavior in the moment, quite often the lower level goals that are, in this, uh, that are underneath the uh, goal of eating, uh, the goal of opening this door now and getting at the food, would be a goal that the individual has generated as a way of fulfilling, uh, as a means of fulfilling their higher level goal. And can the goals be consciously changed, at least in certain animals? Uh, again, the word conscious is a little difficult for me there, but um, uh, yes, I would say I, I, that's the whole thing. So I can have a goal of getting this food here, but then I see a predator coming and I say, oops, I think I'll change my goal. So yes, I, I, I think if you're a psychological agent and especially, I'm just hedging a little bit because I don't know about the agents, the, the, the lizards where they're just goal directed agents without any executive control. Mm -hmm. But from the time you have executive control on, which would be mammals, uh, then I think yes, with executive control, uh, you have some control over what your goals might be. You don't have any control over whether you're hungry or not, but you have control about whether you go for this food now. Mm -hmm. What is the role played by emotions here? Emotions are difficult. Um, so uh, I don't, again, I don't know about birds and other animals off the line to humans, but in the, in the, you know, if, if you look at um, fish and reptiles, um, maybe they have some emotions. I don't know. I mean, I, I would say the only one that looks like a good candidate behaviorally is fear. Uh, uh, but I don't even know if you would want to say they have emotions, but they arise quite importantly and in, in play an important role in mammals um, and including the social emotions. So, um, you know, we know that uh, mammal mothers, uh, you know, feed and protect their young. Um, and, and I'm sure they love their young. Uh, they fight and get angry at one another. And so they're social creatures and they have a lot of social emotions uh, that have um, evolved to uh, help regulate these uh, social interactions and some like fear, which are not so much social, but, uh, um, um, and, uh, they basically, again, in the same manner as the, as the, um, as the agent of organization in general, uh, they allow for more flexibility. Like, like I said, the evolution of desire, uh, I desire this, 
but I can suppress that desire if I need to, or I can, you know, direct it in another direction if circumstances change. So, um, so I think um, uh, emotions generate behavioral tendencies, but they can be uh, they can be modified. So let's just say a predator's coming. The lizard typically will have one or two possible responses. They freeze or they run back to the burrow. That's it. Um, and a mammal will have a bunch of different responses that might be possible to their fear. So um, uh, the, the, it's not just a stimulus response thing, but it's a response tendency. The, um, um, the emotion theorist, um, uh, <clears throat> I forgot his name, a Dutch guy, uh, talks about uh, emotions as um, creating action tendencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, so moving on in our evolutionary history, we get into the first rational agents and you give the example of chimpanzees. So what are rational agents? What do they add to the picture here? And why do you focus on chimpanzees particularly? Um, so um, I don't, um, I went back and forth about whether to call it non-human primates or great apes. And I, I ended up going with great apes because the data I think are clear for great apes and for non-human, uh, for um, non-ape primates, the data are mixed. So I didn't know exactly where to draw the line. So I went with the safe one, which is great apes. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I wanna call them rational for two reasons. One is they understand the causal re causal relations in the world and intentional relations. Causal relations like in tool use, that you you know you need a long tool to solve this problem, a, a, and a, a soft tool won't work. And so they understand certain causal relations in the environment, and they understand. This is a lot of our work over the last 20 years has been showing that great apes understand others as intentional agents who pursue goals and who see things and who adjust their behavior based on what they see. And so they understand why things are happening. I don't think squirrels understand why things are happening. Uh, and the why means understanding the causes or the intentional structure of an agent they're, they're, that, they, they're, that their behavior is generated by goals and perceptions, right? So they're rational in the sense of understanding causes including intentions as a special case. And secondly, they're rational in the sense that in their decision-making, we have studies showing that they are able, when they're uncertain about something, we have an experiment where they think the food is in one place and then new information comes and it seems like it's in another, and they could go with the first one or they could go with the second one. But what they do is they stop and we, in the experiment, we have a way that they can climb up and look and, and, and check. So initially they think it's in this place, now they're not sure, and so they check. And that's one of the philosophical distinction, one of the philosophical criteria for rational decision-making is that you know you could be wrong and you're checking, all right? That's rational. Uh, and, um, and, and so the, those two senses uh, are, the, are the ones that are, um, uh, seem to me to make them rational. And then the architecture supporting that kind of behavior, that kind of understanding and behavior is a, a second level of executive control on top of the executive level. And I call that the reflective level, but you could call it metacognition if you wanted to. Metacognition um, is, 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 is the same idea but it doesn't emphasize the decision-making part of it, so um, or agency part of it. But it's a metacognitive uh, con control, if you will, um, and so they can reflect on their own decision-making. Um, and I think that level is needed for them to. Now, now we're getting off into a slight side thing here, but I believe that the um, the way they have come to understand others as intentional agents is by they have access to their own intentional states from this reflective metacognitive level and they attribute them to others. And I know there are people with other theories about this, but that's my, that's my theory. And it's, I've, I've hinted at it previously, but this book is the place where I spell it out. And then I also have a new paper that spells it out also. But um, uh, um, 
I personally, there's a lot of philosophical discussion about simulation theories uh, of theory of mind versus theory theories of theory of mind. And there are a lot of details there that, that to me get people distracted. The basic idea, the basic fundamental fact is this. If I say, I know that squirrel sees that nut, how do I understand seeing? I understand it on analogy to my own seeing. What else could it possibly be? I, I, there, I don't see what else you could possibly have. I mean, I understand that what's happening to that squirrel is what's happening to me when I look and see the nut. He's seeing it in the same way. If a creature came down from Mars and said, I'm grooning that tree, and, and it, it was some kind of perception, and I say, well, what, what is grooning? What kind of perception is that? And they try to explain it, and I don't have any idea what it is. And, right, so it just seems to me, and this goes all the way back to my 99 book. I even talk about this a little bit, but I spell it out here. Uh, it just seems to me that um, the, the structure of my understanding of others is based on my understanding of my own structure. Um, and uh, th then what happens after that can be quite complicated. So it may be that on certain levels, I understand what others are doing more than I can reflect and understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. My colleague, Tamar Kushner, keeps pushing, keeps pushing me on that, saying, okay, yes, I, I get it, that uh, you know the whole concept of seeing comes from your own seeing. But then when you're actually interacting with others, we're awfully ignorant about why we're doing what we're doing ourselves, but we can, we, we're better about understanding why others do things. So it, it may, that's why I'm saying it's complicated. It may be uh, that there are different levels of this. And in some sense, we understand others' actions better than we understand our own. Uh, but still, the fundamental understanding, the most basic understanding of others as intentional agents, I believe, um, is coming from my metacognitive access to my own uh, decision making and cognition and, and then attributing it to others as because they're like me, they're, they're working like me. Mm -hmm. Do we know if uh, prior agents in evolutionary history, I mean, agents before these first rational agents come on the scene, have any understanding of agency or do, do they attribute any sort of agency to other conspecifics, for example? Do we know that? Um, uh, well, I mean, there are these studies with birds, right? The, 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 um, the corvids and the scrub jays and stuff, uh, but they're off the line to humans. So they've done something. Um, uh, it seems to be confined only to one behavior, caching, whether they know whether somebody's watching or not. So it's to the in terms of the information we have now it might be limited to that one context we it maybe not we, maybe there's more but that's all we know about um uh you know dogs know some things we've done some studies with dogs dogs are kind of special in some ways uh but dogs know whether you're watching them or not uh they don't they don't steal some food when you're watching and they do when you turn your back so there are other creatures that have parts of it uh, but um, what the chimps really seem to, and, and, and I would say other non-human primates, they're pretty good evidence that, um, that rhesus monkeys know a good bit. Um, and rhesus monkeys are, are circopithecine, they're old world monkeys. So I don't know about, old world monkeys are right before apes. And so I don't know about new world monkeys or, or you know, um, prosimians and, uh, you know, the, the columbine monkeys in, in Asia, there's just not any good data on it. So I would say from what I can see, it would be the most would be circopithecine monkeys and apes along the line to humans. And it may be that some other mammals like, I mean, dogs are a special case because humans selected them. <laughs> so I don't see any evidence of dogs knowing that other dogs see things. They just know about humans. So I don't know about that, and the birds may be a limited case. So I would say the f sort of full-fledged understanding that others' behavior. So I, I've always, I've never liked the term theory of mind, and because I think it's actually um, um, carving nature at the wrong joints. What it is is it's a theory of action based on mental constructs. So I have a theory of why you are doing what you're doing, and that theory is based on what you believe 
what your goals are and what you want to be the case and what you believe to be the case. Right? So it's a theory of a mentalistic theory of action. And that's not as that's not as clever or fun as theory of mind. So it's not going to catch on. But anyway, I would say that it's clearest for great apes that they understand that others action is driven by their pursuit of a goal and their perception of the world and, and, and whether it matches the goal or not. And whether some other creatures can do that or not, I would say the best other evidence is rhesus monkeys. Um, and, um, uh, and there may be some other monkeys. Baboons have hardly been investigated at all. There are almost no studies of theory of mind like things in baboons and they're terrestrial and big brained and everything. Uh, so it could be some of those guys, but I would say from what I can tell, um, it would be Circopithecine monkeys, capuchin monkeys over in the New World branch um, don't show great evidence of understanding that others see things and stuff. They don't under, They don't have great evidence of showing that others under, have goals. So Circopithecine monkeys and maybe a few little pieces of it in other places. Mm -hmm. And then we arrive at the first socially normative agents. And here you focus on humans, but I would like to ask you, what do you mean by humans here exactly? Are you talking just about Homo sapiens, or are you including other? Uh, no, a terminology, a terminology that I adopted back in my two books on natural history, and and I repeat it here, and I think I explain it briefly, but um, um, uh, I'm talking about Homo, the genus Homo. So two million years or something like that, um, and. Uh, and really the important things happen uh, that I'm proposing here, they, they could have started two million years ago, uh, but they really are consolidated about a half a million years ago. Homo heidelbergensis, I get a lot of anthropologists criticizing that and saying, you know, they were probably doing something before. The, the, you know, dates are important to anthropologists, they're not critical to me. I just wanna say somewhere, uh, after Homo emerged a couple of million years ago, uh, they're really having to collaborate to uh, to get food. So uh, this is where the selection pressures for shared agency and shared intentionality really start. Mm -hmm. And what distinguishes really these agents from the ones we talked about before, the rational agents? So they are actually forming a shared agency. Um, and so if you and I decide to do something together, say, let's go have a cup of coffee. Okay, we are now a shared agent going to do this together. How do we know that? Because if you suddenly turn around and stop and go in another direction, I say, Ricardo, what are you doing? You said you were coming. What, you know, what are you doing? Or if we're playing a role, you know, we're going to do a, a job together and you just sit down and start smoking a cigarette, I say, what are you doing? You know, we said we were going to do this together. So that's why I call it an agent because we are pursuing a joint goal. We want to get this thing together. We're solving a problem together. We both want the same thing and we know we want the same thing. And we have a self-regulatory mechanism, which is this normative control. Now notice that the, the reason it's normative is because, and this is critical, if you and I have a joint commitment to solve this problem together and we're in the middle of it and I don't like what you're doing and I say, Ricardo, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing this. Now that is a very different proposition than me saying, I don't like it when you do this. You know, I prefer you to do that. That's my personal opinion. And that's just me as a person talking to you as a person. But we're in a shared agency, you're my partner. And, and we agreed we were gonna do this. That's the joint commitment. And so now when I say you should be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that, where is that should coming from? It's not my personal opinion. This is the joint agent that we created and agreed that we were going to, you know, cooperate to get this goal together. And what I'm essentially saying to you is if you want to maintain this shared agency, this joint agency, then you've got to say, oh, sorry, and get back in line. Now you can blow it off. But then the shared agency is gone. If you want to keep the shared agency, so the normative control is me telling you, if you want to maintain our joint commitment and the shared agency that it created, you have to get back in line. And so that's, the, that's collaborative self-regulation. 
So we have a shared goal, a joint goal, if it's the two of us, a joint goal. We have joint attention relevant to things to the joint goal, and we have joint or collaborative self-regulation. So that's why I want to call it an, a single agent that's a shared agency. And, um, and, and so I don't think there are any more levels of executive control. Um, um, I think we are rational agents like apes. That shows you how similar we are to them. In a lot of activities that we do individually, I think we are thinking just like an ape. Uh, if I'm using an individual tool in my backyard to, you know, I think I'm probably, my the cognition is very similar to what an ape would do if he were using the same tool in the same way. But once we put our heads together with others, um, uh, then something new happens and we have to take the perspective of the other. We have to see what our role is and we know that we have to play our role in a certain way. And so this whole new way um, emerges. We get perspectives. So we have joint attention on something and you have your perspective and I have my perspective. So we are jointly attending to this and you see it from that angle and I see it from this angle. Um, and so a lot of what makes human cognition unique and flexible, uniquely flexible, is that we can say, well, I can look at it like this, I can look at it like that. I can think of this as a dog, I can think of it as an animal. I can think of it as a pet. I can think of it as lots of things. Uh, so that kind of flexibility comes from our being able to take perspectives socially. And I don't think great apes can take different perspectives as they please. I don't think they understand themselves to playing, be playing a role in a collaboration with a normative obligation to play their role uh, toward the group. So I think all that comes out of a unique form. Yes, great apes do some things together. They have group hunting of monkeys and, uh, and they travel together and they fight in coalitions and alliances. But I'm just saying, I believe it's an empirical fact based on our experimental studies that they are not forming a joint agency of the type that I'm describing here with norm with with joint a joint goal joint attention and um and and joint self-regulation mm -hmm. so social norms are these uh, are they something that we only find in human societies so so the, the i have two levels with the early humans and so that's early that's early what i'm calling early humans and then modern humans homo sapiens homo sapiens sapiens in the last yeah whatever you want to say, one to 200,000 years ago, um, they uh, have a collective intentionality, which is the cultural group. And the cultural group is this group-minded way of thinking, in-group, out-group, but also interacting, even when I interact with other individuals, I interact in the context of social conventions and norms and institutions. So you're absolutely right. In every cultural group in the world over, there are cultural norms. And cultural norms or social norms are their kind of collective self-regulation. They're the way the group expects each individual to behave, to stay a, a member in good standing of the group. And part of your obligation as a member of the group is not only to follow the norms, but to tell other people to follow them. So somebody else, I don't know, throws trash in the, in the yard. You say, what are you doing? No, you know, you, you can't do that. You know, you have to do this, you can't do that. So we have all these studies showing young children, um, you know, intervening when other people break the rules and saying, no, that's wrong. You can't do it. Um, so these are group level norms that are not just a joint commitment that you and I made, but that are um, a creation of the group as a whole. And yes, there are some commonalities across cultural groups, but there are also some, you know, particular differences about uh, um, you know, very particular um, uh, social norms that are particular to groups. So they're both. They're both, you know, more general ones and more and more uh, specific ones. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the role that culture plays in collective agency? In collective which? Uh, agency. Um, um, one of the things that gets me in trouble is people are always thinking about what I call contemporary humans. <laughs> and that means since agriculture and civilization. What I'm talking about is modern humans, meaning uh, almost, you know, 100,000 years ago or something. Um, and then cultural groups were quite there was no ambiguity about what was a cultural group. It's those of us who live together. We all know one another. We dress the same. We use the same language. We eat the same food. Uh, and those guys on the other side of the river, they're strange. And, I, you know, they eat, just, you know, they eat funny things. They dress funny. They talk funny. We don't know about them. So I think when you're talking about cultural group like that, 
That's the cultural agency. And that group uh, makes uh, collective decisions. Where should we go? Now, they may have a leader that makes, you know, that has more a louder voice than others, but still the group has to, by consent, the, the natural form of human decision making in groups is consensus. If there are five of us and we say, where should we go to eat? We talk until everybody says, okay, let's go have pizza, right? And we just, that's the natural form of group decision making is we argue and we whatever, but then in the end we say, okay, okay, we're all agreed, let's go do this. So that's what the, the collective agency makes a collective, they pursue a collective goal of finding the best hunting grounds. They make a collective decisions to travel to the north. Um, and, all right, now in the, in the contemporary world, I, you know, what is a cultural group? I have no idea. Um, it, you know, it's fr from the time of, of cities and civilization, all these different cultural groups are all multicultural in one place. And yes, there are some places where they're more like a single culture. There are other places that are very cosmopolitan with all different cultures mixed in. So, you know, that's one of the challenges is for us to um, see if our our, 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 our adaptations for cooperation in small group settings, hunter-gatherer cultures, uh, whether that will scale up to the contemporary world or not, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's our challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've already been touching on these throughout our past few questions, but what would you say are the aspects of sociality that are uniquely human? Uh, they are about cooperative action. So um, I think we have certain emotions of uh, not just this general mammalian social emotions of attachment and all of that, but we have things like uh, pride and shame and guilt. Uh, we have resentment toward people that are not treating us cooperatively. So I think we are equipped with a number of, uh, we, 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 uh, uh, we assign blame to people when they do something wrong. Uh, I think these are all uniquely human and they're all about cooperation. So I think we have cooperative cognition, again, to repeat myself, joint goals, joint attention, uh, social norms, um, uh, you know, we kind of share reality that a culture creates. Um, those are all the sort of cooperative cognition, um, and then the, and we have cooperative emotions, and uh, and then morality is our kind of cooperative um, regulation of our social behavior. So, the uniquely human um, uh, psychology is all um, we, we. You could even say the vast majority of our psychology is grade eight primate psychology, but the uniquely human part is cooperative psychology. Mm -hmm. So one last question then, since your book is about agency, specifically the evolution of agency, would you say that it would have any implications for debates and questions surrounding free will or not? Yes, to me, um, uh, I'm not a philosopher, even though I read a lot of philosophy and I, I use it to some degree. Uh, but there are aspects of philosophy that just mystify me, and the and the free will is a uh, is a question that mystifies me. I don't really um, I, I don't really get it. Um, uh, if if I don't believe anybody really believes it. If you really believed that I have no free will, then you would never blame me for anything, right? I could I could smack you in the face. I could steal your iPhone. I could do whatever I want. You would just say, oh, it's all determined, you know. So. Uh, now, I understand the philosophers will say the fact that we believe in free will doesn't mean that it exists. I understand that, I'm, uh, but uh, um, they themselves don't believe it when they interact with other people, is what I'm saying. So it seems to me uh, uh, that um, uh, I have a colleague who asked me about that, and I would say to me, this whole thing about, you know, my whole take on agency is uh, that at the very least, vertebrates, and I'm sure certain other creatures as well, but it's, at the very least, all vertebrates, uh, you know, have a, a, a touch of free will because they're making choices and mammals for sure, where they can actually, uh, you know, reflect on their decision, you know, check out their decisions and stuff. And so, um, uh, yes, I just, I just think, 
maybe it's simple minded, but in the in the formulation of the question that to me makes sense, uh, of course they have free will, and in, in, and indeed the um, the um, the premise of the of the book on agency is that um, is that you know uh, natural selection creates a mechanism by which individuals can make um, their own individual choices. Mm -hmm. Very well. So the book is again the evolution of agency, behavioral organization from lizards to humans. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. Uh, Dr. Tomasello, just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you or your work on the internet? Uh, I'm not much of a social media person, so uh, uh, I don't even have a personal web page. I guess I have one associated with my lab at the department and stuff. Um, um, I guess you have to look hard for me. But if you, you know, if you type Michael Tomasello into Google, you'll get lots of hits. Okay, great. So thank you so much again for coming on the show, and it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this episode until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there, starting at $1 per month. You also have links to PayPal. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Nlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at nlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans, Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, o Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Unig, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adan Rosmani, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidis, Simon Fzal, Adrian Gagey, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, and Sunny Smith. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull, and Noon Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.